Tell me when you think it's in there because I'm going to make sure I can pull it up here on my iPad so I can monitor the chat. Okay. I see it, and let's see if we got sound. Oh, we got sound. We're here. Good. You should be able to pull it up now. Yep. Let me make sure my sound is off on this. All right, it is 1230. Hello, all. Welcome to the JCPS Digital Learning Channel. This is our afternoon session of virtual trainings. We, we being I, James Unger, Jim Unger, will be your host this afternoon from JCPS Digital Innovation. Uh, we have a few shows lined up. I'm on the schedule here that you can find in the NTI Toolkit for Teachers. Making Literacy Relevant and Collaborative with Jenny Aberly, Emily Sales, and Rosie Bartles. We have Amplifying Student Voice at 1 o'clock with Christy Mudd. At 1.30, we have Customizing Reports in Campus Instruction. Highly recommend that one uh, for many people. Uh, that was with Amy Mueller, the Infinite Campus Guru, and Michelle Brown. At 2 o'clock, we have Theater During NTI with Shelby Steege and Melissa, Melissa Gano. Sorry. And at 2.30, we have our final live show, which is NTI in the primary grades with Jessica Cullen and Sade Graves from Digital Innovation. And at 3 and 3.30, you'll see that we have on-demand videos linked up for you that you can play at your own time uh, using Jamboard and using Photo Voice during NTI. So two great ones there for some collaboration tools. But bringing it back, we have our Making Literacy Ladies are you all there and ready? We're here. Can you hear me okay? Absolutely. All right. So hello, everybody. I am Jenny Aberly, and I am really just kind of your co-host today to introduce two of our fantastic high school ELA teachers who are going to share some really good NTI and during regular time resources that they use in their classroom. First up is Emily Sales, who is a teacher at Manual, and she is gonna share with us um, how to create meaningful connections with students through independent reading. And then after her, we'll have Rosie Bertels, who is an ESL teacher at Iroquois, and she has a really cool writing lesson on how to make literacy relevant and um, where students write and choose their own adventure stories. So with that said, Emily, I'm going to turn it over to you to share your screen and teach us some great things about how to engage students in independent reading. Okay, thank you. I am attempting to share my screen right now. Can you all see that? Uh, it says loading. We'll give it a minute here. It should pop up. It looks like it's yeah. too. <laughs> Technology, right? Um, Bill? Can you try stop presenting and present again? You had it up earlier. Yeah, I, I did. It is. Oh. Yeah, you're sharing your screen. I don't know why. Right. <laughs> it's just not loading when I go to full screen. So um, is it okay if I share with partial screen? Is that yeah, okay? It'll have to be, won't it? Yeah. <laughs> right, absolutely, it'll be fine. Okay. Um, thanks for introducing me, Jenny. I'm Emily Sales. I'm an English teacher at DuPont Manual High School. And I'm here to talk to you all today about creating meaningful connections, um, the relationship between standards, independent reading, and the world. Um, just to go over my rationale, um, my first assignment for the students was to task them with finding an independent, oops, and now it's gone again. I'm not sure what's happening. I think I've lost my internet. Uh, well, we're still oh, I still have well, you all. Yeah. You, yeah, you're still here, so that's good. <laughs> okay. So just uh, one little Google trick that I would use when you're worried about internet connections like that and you're presenting something is to have it so that it's, you, you ever gotten the prompt to say, would you like to work on this offline? 
Yeah, it it, it was. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. It's just really being cranky then. Yeah, it is. At this at this exact time. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Well, I'm not sure if um, Rosie might want to go ahead while I get this technology short up. Would that be okay? Sure, it's fine with me. Okay. Actually, wait. It's back. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. No worries. And We're not worried about it. Oh, and it's full screen. Look at you. And it's full screen now. Good yeah. Job. Okay. <laughs> yes. Um, hi. So what I tasked my students to do in the beginning was to find an independent reading novel and just kind of evaluate why they chose it. I've always used independent reading as a cornerstone to my English classroom. Um, and that was something that was really important for me to integrate into my NTI work as well. Um, I, I tasked my students to find a canonical work from American literature because I do teach a junior English class. But, you know, it could be easily adapted to any content or grade net level. Um, each of these weekly projects are based on different uh, core reading standards. And I wanted to create projects where students could take each standard and apply it to both their independent reading novel as well as their lives right now using different aspects of multimodal communication. Um, by applying uh, standards to both literature and life, I've seen students create meaningful connections to the universality of each standard so that they realize that standards are not just tools to interpret literature, but they're also tools to interpret the world around us. The first project I gave them um, was an assignment where I wanted students to create a Google slide to explore how authors' description of setting helps to inform the mood of a work of literature. So first off, students were to find passages from their independent reading novel where the author used descriptive details to both inform the reader about the setting as well as the mood it creates. Students found pictures on the internet uh, that matched up with the setting passage that they chose. This is an example from student work. Um, this particular student is reading The Handmaid's Tale by Margaret Atwood. And you can see she chose a passage from the text that she thought hinted uh, with description, descriptive language at setting. And she decided that that created a bleak mood, which I agree with. Um, students were to find three examples of this from their independent reading novel. And then I tasked them to actually go around and become the writers themselves with setting. So what they did is they went around their house and took pictures of different rooms in their house and they had to write about it using des descriptive setting details and decide what mood those details ended up creating. Uh, they really enjoyed it. They enjoyed taking the pictures. Um, there seemed to be a lot of engagement in this particular project. Um, my next project was characters in quarantine. And for this assignment, I really wanted students to explore nuances of characterization, but in a more flipped way. So. What I did is I asked them to suppose that their characters were living in quarantine in 2020 and had access to social media. What would their characters be doing with their free time? So what students did was design Instagram pages um, for the different characters in their novels. As you can see, this particular student is reading Little Women. Um, and this is the first one she did on Joe March. You can see the Instagram post up here on the right. And then she wrote about it using textual evidence from the book, justifying why she created the post that she created. Um, she did another one with Beth March. You can see she's doing a little housework. That's how she's spending her quarantine time. So this was a really creative way to look at characterization in novels and to use textual evidence to justify choices. Uh, my next project that I'm going to talk about is a literary device soundtrack. So for this, I tasked students with creating a double-sided soundtrack um, where side A were song choices that were supposed to be based on their independent reading novel, and side B were song choices that focused on their life right now. Um, so each side was to have five songs that reflected different literary devices. So for instance, with figurative language, the side A side had to reflect the book that they're reading. This particular student is actually reading In Cold Blood by Truman Capote. 
um, and she chose Four Walls by Bastille. And she had, to, and in her um, reflection, she talked about the figurative language that relates to the book and the metaphors. Um, and then for side B, which is the personal reaction to songs with the figurative language, she did Lost by Frank Ocean and talked about the metaphor of losing yourself because everyone around you is changing, which I thought was very poignant. Um, here's another example of that same student who explored theme, um, talks about the theme and in, in Cold Blood of mental illness. And she chose a song that correlated to that and justified her choices with textual evidence from both the song as well as the novel. And then side B, of course, was the theme to her soundtrack at this time. So she talked about this particular song, Girl, with resonating with her because of the empowering theme of rising up beyond your circumstances. Um, so there were a lot of challenges that I met with NTI work, um, and I just wanted to talk real quick about how I overcame some of those challenges. The first one I found is maintaining Google Meets with online class sessions because not all students have access at the same time. What I've been doing is recording my meetings and posting them to Google Classroom so that students can go back and watch them later. Um, another challenge is designing lessons that aren't necessarily new material, but rather review of previously taught standards. And as an English teacher, our standards tend to loop. So this was a really easy time to use those essential standards as a foundation for my assignments. Um, and also allowing students to select their own independent reading novel um, kind of gave them this choice where it wasn't necessarily, it was new material, but it was material that wasn't provided by me. They could choose it. So the third challenge, um, which I think a lot of teachers, especially at the high school level can relate to is student engagement. And again, um, giving students choice for independent reading novels helped them get more engaged. They have more investment in what they're reading if they chose it. Um, but also designing lessons that encourage creativity and utilize multiple mediums and modalities of communication, whether it's from pictures or soundtracks or social media posts, designing those creative multimodal um, lessons really help to engage the students and keep learning fresh. Um, but finally, I just wanna say that most poignant for me through a lot of my work has been giving students the opportunity to interpret this time period in a meaningful and safe way. Um, so by taking reading standards and relating it to both to independent reading and also to the li their life around them right now, they've been able to reflect on this time period. Um, and they seem to really appreciate getting the space to do that in an assignment. Um, I wanted to post my contact information up here just in case anybody has any follow-up questions for me. And that's it. I'll turn it over back to Jenny. Thanks, Emily. Um, we've had some good comments in the chat box. If anybody has any questions to add in there, you're welcome to do that. I love so much about those um, lessons um, that you shared with students. It's so meaningful, it connects, uh, it's engaging. Thank you very much for sharing those. And I'm gonna now turn it over to you, Rosie, so you can share your screen and I will mute my mic and let you take it away and tell us about creating your own story. All righty, I am trying to find my closed captioning, but I am not seeing, oh, I see it, Never mind. Um, I was trying to get this set up. Nope, that's not it either. Yeah, closed captioning is only available when you're doing presenting your slides. That's why you're not seeing okay. it. Okay. You're okay. So, there you go. Right. Okay. And then at the bottom, there's a CC. There, right. You got it. Yeah. All right. I got it. We do the text the size. Pros. I love it. I'm going to be jump. Yes. And I'm going to be jumping in and out of these slides because I kind of want to show um, different aspects. So um, I've been doing Choose Your Own Adventure. I teach high school English as a second language students, um, sophomore, juniors, and sometimes I have seniors. And so last year I came up with this idea to give students their own opportunity to um, have some choice and some voice in their writing assignments. They do these collaboratively. So um, they I put them together in groups of two or three, depending on what their skill levels are so that they'll have the opportunity to be successful. So first I'm gonna show you a project from last year. 
My students are currently doing the same project. And if I have enough time, I'll show you where they are. We have about 10 more days to finish up the project. But I start out by having the students write a two-page Google document collaboratively to come up with their own story. And as they write that joint story, so these four slides here are the joint story between two of my students. So they write those two pages together and then they branch off. They make a copy of that joint document because sometimes I've had students interrupt um, somebody else's writing or delete work and it gets frustrating. So they make a copy and then they go ahead and write their own middle to the story and two endings. So by the time they're finished with this project, they have a story with four different endings, four different paths to go through. So I'm just gonna show you one of the student's paths. So this is his middle. There's 10 more sharks that come to the beach. So, oh no, what happens? And then this is his first ending, the sharks underneath the water. And it continues until we get to the end. And then Google Slides is a great mechanism for putting the story together. Uh, to enable the reader to choose where they want the story to go. That's the goal of the Choose Your Own Adventure. So I have students go back to this initial screen so that they're able to, um, the reader is able to go and choose a different path. And then of course, the ending has to be a thank you to the reader uh, for the work that they, um, they have been doing. So I'm just gonna make sure my closed captionings are still on. Yeah. Okay, so um, what I've done, and this presentation will be available to you, I'm not going to go ahead and click on these, but these are videos that I've given my students that will allow them, I've done the same thing that Emily did. I have class meetings at 11 and 1 o'clock during the week, and I record those sessions, so I'm teaching them what they need to do on their project, and then I'm recording it so they can go back and reference it. I also set up private meetings if my students need it with either the group or with themselves. So this is a hyperlink to how to create hyperlinks. I'm gonna show you that in a moment. And then this is a hyperlink on how to put those background pictures into the Choose Your Own Adventure presentation. For those of you who may teach younger grades or you might not want a complicated long writing project, I'm done collaboratively. My students actually this semester they um, had finished the joint part of the story and part of the middle before we went to NTI. So they had to finish the middle and the endings um, from home. And then we put the Google Slides together. But uh, if you wanna do a smaller project or you have younger grades or students who are not tech savvy, you see over here on the left, here's a presentation. And this is actually the link that's in my presentation. You can see there's only two sentences and the reader can choose, do we open the box? If we open the box, it would link to slide number three. Do we go back downstairs? It would link to slide number four. So if you don't wanna write a long complicated story or your students aren't able to do that, this is always an option for you also. So on this slide, I'm gonna go ahead and um, escape out of the presentation. I'm just gonna show you quickly um, how we put one slide together, just to give you an idea of how easy it really is. So, um, excuse me while I type for a moment, I can't type and talk at the same time. Once upon a time, a little girl went to go see her grandma. But she saw a wolf. Okay, so you just have them write the story. If we had more time, we would make the font larger, we would decorate it. But I just wanna show you some of these other features. So here, in order to put the background in, we're talking about a wolf. So I was working on this previously. You just go in there to uh, background. You can upload a picture from your computer. You can take one with your camera. You can go to photos or Google Drive. I just went to a Google image search. Choose the picture that you want, click insert, click done. Voila, it's right there in the background. So once again, if I wanted to do this, cause I can't see these words, we're gonna go down here to 30 and we're gonna make these white. So there I have my words in my picture. Then to put in the hyperlink, all the students need to do is go insert, shape. And then you go down here, I like the bevel. 
Just click on it there, right click, do a link. So we're gonna do slides in this presentation. They're gonna go to the next slide and apply that. Need some words in there. So I'm just gonna say, um, she runs home. You can make those words larger if you wanted to. Um, same thing for the other side, you'll go insert shape, create another, another beveled button. I had more time, I would make sure they're exactly the same size, but you get the idea. So slides in this presentation, we're on slide four. So we're gonna go to slide six. I'm down here, pick slide six, apply that, put words in there. Let's see, she runs home there. We're gonna say she hides. So now if I go to present, obviously it's not going to go to the next part of the story, but it gives you the idea. She runs home would go there. And if I come back here, she hides would go to a completely different slide. So that's the idea of how this works. Uh, why do this during NTI? Uh, it's really engaging for the students to find out that they are creative writers and that they can write well. The collaboration brings them some kind of a connection between themselves and their classmates. Um, so here are some of the challenges. I've done some of the same things Emily did, record my class sessions, post that on Google Classroom. Here's something that's really important, I think, when we're working with technology to model being a lifelong learner. Uh, to learn alongside of our students, that we don't have to be experts. Some of my students have figured out things on Google Classroom um, that they needed to do, and I've asked them how they did that. Some of them have been very creative with their slides. Also offering the private sessions and the group sessions. The great thing about Google Docs and Google Slides is that students can collaborate on shared slides and docs, and you can also put comments and then guide and encourage um, them through the things that they're doing um, on the slides. I'm not going to go through all of these. These are more for your reference. But over here on the left hand side, if you have um, you want to do shorter stories, this is the path that's on that video that I put the link. So you have the slide, you have a couple of sentences for the story, two paths um, as options. First option will go to slide three. Second option will go to slide four. Next slide continues those stories. And the last thing students have to do is add backgrounds and hyperlinks. This is what I've done with my students. They collaborate on a joint story. Maybe you want a shorter story. So they do a joint story that's two thirds of a page and not two pages. And they do that on a shared document. Then they make a copy of their joint story. So they have a copy for themselves. They write their own middle and two endings. They collaborate on the Google Slides. Um, normally, I determine the path for them based on the number of students that they have in their group. If there's two or three, groups of three have 24 slides. For NTI, I went ahead and put their stories onto the correct slides and then told them where they would send the hyperlink to just to make it a little bit easier for them since I'm not right there in the classroom to show them on the keyboard how to do that. And they've put all their background pictures in and their hyperlinks and made the text look appealing. This is my contact information if you'd like more information. And since we do have another minute or two, I'm going to go ahead and show you my students' current progress on their story. Um, so I'm just going to share this screen. I'm not going to go through the presentation because it's not all finished. But these students have done all of the work on these Google Slides. Google Slides were not put together before NTI started. So here is their title. Here is their joint story. This is one of my sophomore students, so it goes down to here. You can see one of the students has his hyperlink for his story to go down. Um, some of the other students are working on making their pages finalized. The thing I love about this is the student uh, collaboration and the choices and the options has really engaged some of my students. One student told me he spent two hours looking for perfect pictures to go with his story. I didn't ask him to do that, um, but you can see that's just a great slide right there. 
So um, they have done a great job on their projects and it's been a great way to keep their writing going um, in the midst of uh, NTI. So I am going to stop sharing my screen and see if we have any questions. I haven't seen any questions, but you have a lot of great comments, uh, both of you, uh, Emily and Rosie. A lot of good conversation going on this afternoon. I really enjoy that part of it. Uh, a lot of people saying, you know, with, with the Instagram, they really liked uh, the amount of choice and the options that give students, especially with distance. And everybody's wanting to get that uh, slide set with the uh, making the choose your own adventure novels. Uh, saying you can see the personalities coming out um, and how students are working. But I did not see any questions come up. Jenny, did you? I did not. Lots of good feedback on teachers who really like this. Um, if you're here today and you've got colleagues who uh, you would like to hear more information about how our teachers are doing this, we have another session at 9 a.m. tomorrow morning. And then another one on Thursday, again, at 1230. So I encourage your teachers to join us. And um, these uh, slide decks will be linked to the, the menu of options, hopefully by tomorrow, that we've submitted those and shared them. So those should be linked and you will have access to them. You have contact information for Rosie and Emily. Both are so nice and friendly and accessible and we'll be more than happy to help you out or answer questions. So um, they would be happy for you to email them. Same thing with me. You can always email me and I'm happy to help out too. Um, thank you so much for having us today. Oh, no problem. Uh, this is excellent. Uh, I, I love all the collaboration you can see there with the students. I think there's a lot of assignments I see coming out in Google Classrooms and such where uh, teachers are kind of skipping out on that collaboration between students, not really feeling that they can do it. Mm -hmm. And I think giving them that, that option is just excellent. Now, do both of you intend, like when you return to the classroom, hopefully soon, um, that you'd be using those assignments? Emily, I'll let you go first. Um, absolutely. I, I think that this work during MTI has really kind of tapped into a lot of creativity that, I've, that it has been um, maybe not as strong in my classroom in the past few years. So it's it's absolutely something I want to integrate back into my normal face-to-face -face classroom. Yeah, I kind of like having that Instagram and being able to use that during the year. That would be fun that, you know, the kids could hit that anytime. And that's just, <clears throat> it's just such a good way to reach them in their area where they live. Rosie? Um, I did this last year and I've done it this year and it's a great um, it's a great tool for writing. It does take a lot of time because of the length of the, the the breadth of the writing that I have them do. But it has been really fun to see the students become creative writers. I've only had one group who told me a story from another culture that wasn't their own. And once they shared it in front of the class, somebody said, wait a minute, that's uh, such <laughs> nice try. But yeah, and then they're going to put this in their backpack, which I love that they'll have a solid writing piece for their backpack project that they did during NTI. So that's our end goal. They'll present these on May 20th to the classmates in our session, and then they'll put it in their backpacks. And I just I just think that'll be memorable for them. That's great. Absolutely. Awesome. Thank you, ladies, for being here this afternoon. And everybody, if you've missed it or came in late, they will be here tomorrow morning at nine. Correct? All right, got head nods. Nine o'clock tomorrow morning, <laughs> a.m. Don't miss out. Great session. Um, get those materials. Check out our schedule. Coming up very soon with me, Jim Unger from JCPS Digital Innovation, we have Amplifying Student Voice with Christy Mudd. And it also looks like I see a little Mimi Ratliff down there in the bottom who's going to be joining us also. Good times, good stuff. Um, if you haven't, make sure you go to the jcps.me forward slash NTI page. Check out the toolboxes there. Go to the teacher toolkit. Check out the link and it will take you to the learning schedule. And the great thing about the learning schedule, not only will you know when all the great trainings are going to be happening, but if you click on where you see blue on there, that will take you to a link that has the slides and presentations they use throughout their presentation. And even if you've missed one, if you see one, 
I cannot tell you enough how valuable those resources are, especially right now. Um, and then you go, oh, well, I'd really like to see them use it. You can go back, especially if you've a, you're a subscriber and you've clicked that little red subscribe button down below. You can come back in and all of the episodes you see here, we break up and we put back on in little 30 minute segments for you to catch at your leisure. So stop by, check those out. All right. I have 1259. Christy, Mimi, are you ladies there? Yes, I'm here. Yay. And Mimi's going to help me out. She's going to be watching the chat box for me and helping nice. me with the questions and everything. So, Okay, it's very active today, which is good. That makes me happy. <laughs> um, will you be presenting? Uh, yes, I'm presenting. And I can share my screen also. Okay. You want me to go Whenever ahead? Whenever you are ready, cheers. Okay, so first, I just wanted to tell everyone, my name is Christy Mudd. Um, I have taught first through fifth, and I've actually taught middle grades at a camp setting, all subjects, all levels of students. So, okay. Um, thank you. How do I, I guess I'm always running the, oh, here we are. Perfect. Okay. So you can see amplifying student voice. All right, perfect. Okay, perfect. And has the captions also. <laughs> okay, so once again, I'm Christy Mudd. I've taught first through fifth grade uh, in the classroom setting and then also middle grades at a camp setting. I've taught all subjects. I've taught all levels of students. And um, I'm actually transitioning into a deeper learning resource teacher job next year. So anyway, I really wanted to share uh, how to amplify student voice through technology and student presentations. Uh, a lot of the examples you're gonna see are actually from a classroom, but they can easily be transitioned to NTI also. Okay, so adding technology to student presentations, one of the biggest things I really feel is it's easier to reach an authentic audience uh, because if you use technology, you can share it you know, with student permission over YouTube, uh, through Twitter and digital platforms that can reach a broader audience that you might not be able to reach in person. You know, inviting those community partners might not always be feasible. Uh, enhancing your 21st century tech skills, it adds another aspect of engagement. Obviously, I never think, I don't think tech should be like just the only engagement aspect, but it definitely adds a layer. Reaches multiple backpack for success skills and can be accomplished with limited technology. My first year really diving into project-based learning. I actually only had one iPad. It was my iPad that I used for um, Class Dojo and it was the teacher iPad. And I had, I think, two or three laptops and then two or three uh, desktops. So it can be accomplished with limited technology. And yes, I do believe that all kids can. Uh, so all of these technology examples you'll see. I do believe that every kid is capable of using, sometimes with different scaffolds. Uh, I will say also throughout these pieces of tech that getting to know my students and knowing their levels of comfortability with technology really helped me also kind of steer them towards certain uh, projects that would have fit, fit their needs better. So I'll just go ahead and jump in. Uh, I've used Canva and PictoChart with my students. Uh, it's available on iPad, Chromebooks, and laptops. They do require logins, and there, uh, but and there's free limited access. Um, the biggest thing when I was using Canva, what I did was I used one of my own emails, and then I created a generic password. And uh, I monitored it, but my students used it and they were able to log in with my logins because at the younger grades, they aren't necessarily allowed to use their login uh, personal information. So on the right, you'll see actually examples of what my students created on Canva. We did a future cities project and they had to identify a problem in a city. And as a group, uh, they designed a solution. And this was with fourth and fifth graders. And so some of them wanted to do marketing. They wanted to create advertisements and flyers to further promote their solution. So uh, one group chose the traffic in Los Angeles. And they designed a program where you could actually get a bike for free. And they thought that that would reduce some of the 
um, automobile traffic on the roads. Another group uh, focused on New York City and how some of their green spaces were disappearing. So they wanted to design a program where people could apply for tax credits to actually, um, if they were willing to put a green space on top of their building or on their balcony or whatever. Um, so both of these were created in Canva. Um, advertisements, marketing, infographics, you know, graphics for slides. Uh, the biggest thing, the tip and trick here was I did have them only use the free templates and the free pictures and the free things. So you, you'll want to monitor or at least emphasize that to students because if they begin with a paid picture or a paid template and they get all the way to the end and they want to download it, it's going to make them pay. Or in my case, it would have made me pay for it. So as I worked with students, I really made sure to see that they were using the free templates. Okay, so um, I've also used Wii Video or iMovie. Wii Video is uh, most compatible with Chromebooks. I, when I the Chromebooks first started rolling out, I really wanted a movie, uh, a movie editing, video editing, you know, website, and so I found Wii Video. Um, it is available on Chromebooks and laptops. iMovie is on iPad, iPhone, Mac, and Apple products. Uh, Wii Video does require a login, and it's actually only free up to five minutes. It will let you create 30 to 40 minutes of videos. You know, it'll let you create as many minutes as you want. But this, when you go to download it, if you download more videos, that if they're longer than five minutes, it will make you pay. Um so if you have older kids that can create their own free accounts, you might be able to be able to get around that. Um, the years that I had multiple students who wanted to create Wii Video uh, projects, I did end up purchasing the paid account. Uh, but if you just want to go in and play around, it is free up to five minutes, and it's an awesome an awesome video editing um, website. Uh, we used it for digital storytelling, creating documentaries, uh, video editing. I wasn't planning on really showing all of the video examples. If you want to go through the presentation and watch them all, some of them are, you know, two to three minutes. And I didn't want to just um, have the entire time be watching videos. Okay. So this is an example. Two, three years ago, my students, um, they were focusing on uh, advocating for Native American rights. And they... As a group, they chose a Native American tribe and they um, researched their past and their present. And then they focused on a problem that they wanted to help solve. And so this group really focused on um, the fact that Native American lands were taken. And um, they created a mock trial and pretty much uh, put the entire case on trial. And they went through that with their project. And this was created with Wii Video, they also use some of the green screen aspects from Green Screen Do Inc., which I'm going to cover shortly. Oh, sorry, one more thing. Uh, Wii Video and iMovie, this is kind of an example I was talking about earlier. Wii Video and iMovie does take quite a bit of student stamina and um, willing to put a lot of work in. So, I really, like I said, I really get to know my students and I've had students who've really wanted to do a green screen reenactment on Wii Video. And I never want to shoot a student down and I would always let them begin the process. But for students who really didn't necessarily have that org those organization skills and those skills to really stay on task at all times, um, I would sometimes steer them to another piece of tech just because we video and iMovie um, involves a lot of scripts, involves a lot of locating videos, locating pictures, a lot of video editing. So although my fourth and fifth grade students were perfectly, and even my third grade students this year, were perfectly capable of using this website, um, I will say that there are students who aren't as successful because it does take a little bit more um, perseverance. Christy? Yes, sorry. I, um, I can't in the somebody in the chat box wants to know how easy we video is compared to iMovie. So I actually uh, used iMovie at my camp because we had all Mac and um, Apple products. And iMovie is not available on Chromebooks. So that's when I found WeVideo. And I would say they're almost identical. Um, so 
I was very easy to trans. It was very easy for me to transition into Wee Video because I had used iMovie at my summer camps so many times um, that I actually found the, found the transition almost the same. So um, if you've used my iMovie, if you ever go on Wee Video, you'll actually find a lot of similarities um, with importing media, importing music and s- songs, and even the bottom part of the video edis- editing almost looks identical, where you layer the photos and you layer the um, audio and you layer the music. Um, so I think if anybody's comfortable with iMovie, then you know transitioning into... Now, I will say iMovie on a computer or on a Mac. Um, on your phone, iMovie does look slightly different um, because it's just on, on an iPhone, it's just slightly different than on like a Mac. Do you think that answers the question? I do. I think that answers the question completely. Thank you. Okay. All right. So we're going to transition into Animoto. And I consider Animoto the low tech version of Wii Video. This is actually what I was meaning, what I steer my kids towards. If they're, for example, last year, I had this group of kids. I try to dive, like make my groups. Um, when I build my groups based off voice and choice, I still try to balance out my levels and my students who I know their growths and their um, strengths. But there was this group of kids who really wanted to work together. Um, they had kind of found their people in my class. Uh, and I, I did a, I let a few of them work together. But they really struggled to stay on task. They had these huge ideas, these creative reenactments that they wanted to do. But their their work, their on task was it was challenging at times. So um, they started out wanting to create a green screen wave video, and I kind of steered them towards an Animoto. And this is actually their project here. And what I like about Animoto, it is limited access free. Um, I have never reached a time limit that it cut me off at, but it does always have the watermark on there, the Animoto trial, if you do not pay. Uh, there's already templates created. It's pretty much just like dragging and dropping. Um, you just drag photos in, it puts it in order, it can put in the transitions, it'll put in, um, it'll do the time lengths. It's almost like, and then you can also drag in, like you can just create one part of it that's just text, things like that. So this one, I would usually steer my, some of my kids to who I knew might not necessarily have the perseverance to stick with Wii Video, so that they still had the video aspect, but uh they weren't gonna come up with nothing they were gonna actually be able to complete the project uh so this one they focused on the global warming and some of the problems we had in our you know around the world and some of the solutions so it has photos it has text um and it has music in the background and actually they did some voiceovers in this also so Inamoto, like i said is a little bit more user friendly and it's definitely something that even my third, fourth, and fifth graders were easily able to do. I did, once again, create a generic login for my kids and um, let them all use it. So we had to have the conversation about not messing with other people's projects and things like that. Um, But once again, the younger kids aren't, well, from my understanding, they're not allowed to use their personal email and information to create accounts. Um, But the older kids probably could do that themselves. Okay, Touch Cats is probably one of my favorites, and it's one that I've used with um, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade. I had my second graders using it this year independently. Um, The only downside is that it's most, uh, I've only found it on iPad. I've not, even on my iPhone, it's different. So iPad is the only place I've found it that it works the way I would like it to. Um, It is free. It does have green screen capabilities. Uh, and it's perfect for like a newscast or talk shows or reenactments. Um, my kids have used it for book talks where they put the book in the background and they talk about the book or product and website reviews. Uh, so if you notice on the right, these are two projects. This was our Future uh, Cities project. And um, this group of kids, they focused on the problem that in downtown Louisville, there's a lot of broken infrastructure and a lot of the piping system pipes are aging. And so they pretended they were on a talk show and the middle student was the um, host and she was asking the other students like what the issues were, how they were going to fix it. So that is actually 
that background and everything is already in TouchCast. And the only thing is, is I did use green screen and it, but it would only be right behind the students. So everything else about that background, even if you didn't have a green screen would be there, but right around the students' heads would be whatever's in your classroom or whatever. Um, but once again, with green screen, you can use a green screen, you can use green paper, you can use a green marker to color paper and make it green. Um, I can't remember if TouchCast does, but a lot of you know apps and websites will let you do blue screens now. But pretty much anything you have green can create the green screen effect. So this is one uh, choice that my students did. And then here's another choice. And this was actually at the Backpack Summer League. They designed their own theme parks. And so he actually, this student created a stop motion video of his theme park and then uh, brought it up during his TouchCast presentation. So in TouchCast, there's this thing called VApps or VAPs. And if you click on it, in that little box, kind of like you see, you can bring up websites, you can bring up photos, you can bring up videos, you can bring up anything. And so it's almost like that person can, almost like on a, you know, a news report, they can talk about whatever's in that smaller screen. They can talk about and give reviews. This kid is just describing his theme park while the stop motion video is playing. Um and then also you notice I use green paper behind him as a green screen, but he didn't want to use a green screen background. He just wanted it to be him. And then to also have his um, theme park showing. It's user-friendly. Like I said, I will, I've will. i I've taught my second, third, fourth, and fifth and sixth grade students to use it. Uh, and I really, I, I really like it. Okay, I think one of the last ones I'm going to be talking about is Green Screen Do Ink. This is on iPad, iPhone, and Androids. This is really more of a green screen video creator. And I often, we would start here and then they would take these videos and embed them in TouchCast or embed them into uh, Wii Video or iMovie or in Animoto. Um, so here I have all different grade levels. There's a second grader, fourth grader, and fifth grader. So just kind of showing that, you know, a wide variety of students can learn to use these uh, apps. It's actually in the second grade video or picture. There's also a second grade student who's actually running the Green Screen Doing app um, because I was really big on them learning the technology also, not just me recording. Uh, so it does not, you have to download the app, but when you open the app, it doesn't require you to log in after it's uh, downloaded. Um, We've used this for reenactments. So they've reenacted different parts of history. They have reenacted uh, scenes from books. I've had students use this for book talks, book trailers, storytelling. The examples here in the top right, that student read a book about Barbie and she's doing a five finger retell and telling me all about the story and about her favorite parts. But what's cool is she put the book, she took a picture of the book and put it in the background of her so that she could talk about that book specifically. Uh, the picture in the middle that student, they were, um, that was from the Future Cities Project, and they were focusing on, I can't remember their problem and solution, but they actually wanted to do uh, a TED Talk. So they put the TED symbol in the background and were pretty much doing a recording of a TED Talk. And then lastly, in the bottom right, that was our Native Amer uh, Advocating for Native American Rights Project. And once again, you'll see that I used green paper because they wanted to use the green screen to make it look like they were sitting at a... Um, in a courtroom. So we had to have multiple things covered in green. And uh, those students were also doing a mock trial uh, reenactment. Um, some big things that I learned, a microphone goes a long way. I don't know if you'll see my, my first year, I did not have a microphone. And when we got to exhibition night and we were playing our videos, there were definitely parts that you couldn't hear. And my kids were disappointed, but I was very proud of them. And I mean, the sound cut in and out, so you did hear it. And they also explained their projects, but the mic made a world of difference. And so you'll notice in two of the pictures, I have a mic. It's actually not wireless. I do still hook it up to the iPad. So it does, we do have to be somewhat close to it. Uh, but the microphone took our projects to a whole nother level. They're so clear. It helps drown out the background noise because 
Uh, I know probably a lot of you are thinking, where's the rest of your class? And in every single one of these photos, I have an entire full class behind those students. Uh, with fourth and fifth grade, I had 30 students every year. And with my second graders, you know, around 20, 22. And the entire class is in that room. Uh, and we try our best to tell everyone to stay quiet. But that microphone really helps draw in the sound from the presenter and not hear the background sounds. Um, a big thing with technology is check-ins. Uh, so honestly, guys, a lot of this presentation was showing you the, the end product. But leading up to this point, we did a lot of storyboarding. We did a lot of scripts. We did a lot of writing. We did a lot of feedback. We did all of those things that built up to this. Um, but I really wanted to show you how these pieces of tech can amplify the students' voices outside of the classroom. Um, another big thing was with these projects, I was so surprised about how much we ended up talking about structure and purpose and tone or mood. When students were talking about advocating for Native American rights and they were using some of those video editing uh, websites, and some of this music is very upbeat and happy and it and it sounds like it's you know the best day ever. So we had to talk about if you're talking about you know a Native American's land being taken, should should the sound behind that be happy? Should the tone be happy? And so um, we talked a lot about structure. Do you want to organize your projects, you know, your videos in sequence? Do you want to um, do you want to organize it in cause and effect, problem and solution? So Anyway, I, uh, my main goal of this was just to show you some of the technology that I've used across grade levels, across subjects, across projects, um, everything like that to amplify student voice. They took ownership, they took over the creating, and ultimately they really bought in. And that's why some of these projects ended up looking so great. Um, some of this technology I was brand new to, and I was so excited about it, though. I would I would introduce it to the students. I would tell them everything that I knew about it. And then sometimes I would just let them go and I would let them test out different parts of it. And they would end up figuring it out much quicker than I could have. Um, so I have also if you want to go to my presentation on the left side are all the websites. They won't all necessarily take you to the app because like I said, some are on iPad, but here are all the websites. Um, in the middle, I have linked videos that are tutorials, kind of what to do once you get to those websites. And then lastly, I've given examples from my classroom of real student, you know, what students have created on their own with those. Um, like I said, this, this would have to look slightly different in NTI. Um, mostly because of the logins. I think that would only be the really big uh, barrier to consider. Um, am I creating a generic login? How am I monitoring, make sure nobody's messing with anybody else's project? Um, things like that. But I could, it, it could easily be transitioned into NTI. Here is my information. My name is Christy Mudd. My email is christina.mudd. A lot of people can't find me. And then I'm on Twitter at cmud 19 I apologize if I have, sorry, I'm going to come back to you all. If I have talked your ears off. Um, but that is pretty much my presentation. If you guys have any questions, I'm open to talking about it. I know there were a lot of videos in there and I would love for you guys to watch those, but um, I know what it's like to sit in a presentation where somebody just shows video after video of video and they're amazing, but you know, using your own time if you would like. <laughs> No, that was excellent, uh, Christina. Uh, everybody was just eating that up in the uh, comments section. Uh, loving your presentation. People were jumping through your presentation, getting ahead of it. Um, <laughs> I, I liked how you were mindful about telling people to be careful what they're having students log into. And if it's okay, I'll take a couple minutes of your time. And mm -hmm. I'd like to show them because I, as I, I'm the technical digital innovation leader for Zone 2, I get questions all the time on, uh, hey, uh, Mr. Unger, are we allowed to use uh, this software? Can I have kids go to this? Uh, what can we use? So yes. What I direct like almost everyone to is go to the jcps.me forward slash software. And there you will have all of the updated statuses for what's going on in JCPS as far as software approval. Um, and the easiest way when you get there is you have this little landing page 
and you can click on any of these tiles down here. Uh, I'm just going to go right to search at the top and it's going to open up the any content area because then it's going to pull from everywhere in case what you're looking for is possibly labeled mm -hmm. as something else. And I'm going to go here. It, well, first of all, let me talk about the colors over here. The one you're looking for is anything with the green color. Green is good. Blue means it's kind of in process and red means uh, you shouldn't even mess with it. Now, based on that, if it's I say, not I haven't in the green, all of my websites. what's that? So, I say, I apologize. I probably haven't screened all my website. So I apologize. No, 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 if no, I'm no. You're fine because you, you said don't have students log in. So oh, yeah. that's what I was going to say. As long as the students aren't logging in, you're really fine with that. We just don't want to release that you know, personal identifiable information or what we call PII. So everybody's favorite that I saw a lot of people talking about was Canva. And we'll see, it's going to slow down a little bit here. And, oh, look at Canva. It is green. So we got approved, reviewed, approved, and hosted. So Can I ask, does that mean you've been students under 13? Because I was told that students under 13 could not create logins with their personal information no matter what. But if you're saying differently, that will change my world. <laughs> so it typically will say, if it's a 13 and over, it'll say that on there, on that little okay. screen. So let me kind of go back then, because that's a very good point, because some of them do have different age restrictions. Because I've only, I you know, I've mostly worked at elementary. So that was something before I started a lot of these projects that I really checked into, because obviously, especially with free accounts, it would be a lot easier if the kids could, because then that would be 30 free accounts versus, you know, using the one. Uh but yes, that's uh, and I I totally understand because like like you said, a lot of websites actually have age limits. Yes. Um, so I'm looking here. Maybe that's not on here anymore. I thought it used to have that age limit on there. So that may be once even it's green, you may want to check on that just to be sure and cover yourself. But I think this is a good starting place. Uh, if you see something like uh, ABC here is in red, definitely do not want to have students logging into that. Um, so just just to throw that out there it was a great point because you have so many resources and i love that you included like little tutorial videos that go along with that how do you use green screen and that that's just an amazing tool green screen is awesome in the classroom i brought mine home because i thought it was essential so it is here with me <laughs> so you take yourself on vacations every once in a while just to see it <laughs> exactly exactly mimi did you see any questions in the chat just the folks that were talking about we video was really the only thing and i think she did a great job of addressing that so oh, absolutely it's, it's an easy job being her wingman today <laughs> <laughs> i agree with that one uh, she did a great job uh another thing i will say um just to plug our channel the digital learning channel since you're on youtube and i know you've all hit that red subscribe button down there <laughs> and you've given a thumbs up for today's video because it's really awesome and she's doing a great job um, if you go in and you search up green screen, not on YouTube overall, but just on the digital learning channel, there's a search bar at the bottom, not the main one, the bottom, not the, the bottom. Um, if you search in that one and search green screen, you will get the video. It was done this year. Um, I think it was right around Christmas time, I believe, or it might have been at the first of the year. It's camera middle school and it's an entire episode that we did live with them and it's uploaded and edited all about using green screens um, with the kids. And it goes mainly into iMovie, but it, it's an excellent tool and a resource if you wanna see one, how it's done, but then two, how you can use it. And it talks about, you can have the pop-up green screens, you can use the green butcher paper, or you can even just use basically any solid color background and it will adjust to that and pick it up. So it's a really handy tool once you learn how to use it, it becomes very easy for the kids. All right, Christy, Mimi, anything to add? You guys did a great job today. Uh, I guess my biggest thing is just, uh, I know teachers have a lot of fear with a lot of these technologies and just know that it wasn't always beautiful and that there were many days that it didn't work for me. There were many days that my kids figured out something that I didn't know and I was actually like, this is amazing. Uh, there were days obviously when the tech didn't work and we had to scrap it for the day. Um, so just to know that like if you're first time around, you go to use some of these and it just fails, that it that it's okay. And that you, if anything, it'll probably make you a little bit better the next time you try it because Always you'll be have like, a backup okay, plan. I know what not to do. <laughs> exactly. And yeah, we call it failing forward. We do it all the time. 
It's part of being All right, innovative. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Christy. All right. Um, thank you for being with us this afternoon. I am Jim Unger with JCPS Digital Innovation. I'm the digital lead for Zone 2, along with my partner, Kathleen Receiver, who was on this morning talking about our STLP state champ in JCPS for the first time ever, Blake Elementary. Go Zone 2 crew. But coming up this afternoon at, oh, let's see, we're at 1.30. Look at that, time is flying. Customizing reports in campus instruction with Amy Mueller and Michelle Brown. I do believe. Let's see. Oh, there's Amy. Oh, look at that hair growing, Amy. I, I feel you. All right. <laughs> I need a haircut. I really need a haircut. I you can have a color in yours. I might have to work on that. I do. I do. You should do it. It would look good with your shirt. Well, thank you. It's such a fun area <laughs> you're in. I love you. you got a dartboard going on. <laughs> well, you know, it's my basement office, so. Make it a fun office. I like it. All right. I see Michelle. Is she monitoring the chat for you today? She is. She is. Well, I don't know what's happened to my, my uh, photos, but I've got it marked off, but it looks like I can't be seen. That's fine. Well, yeah, that's an <laughs> interesting icon. I've not seen that icon before. Oh, I know what it is. Oh, hey, there you, you are. There so it can is. we see who's on the, who has joined us or... There is no like attendance list. I can kind of look through there and see, oh, I see Heather Worrell has joined us, Russ Hockenberry, Alan Young, okay. Mimi Ratliff's in the chat, Vicki Walker. Okay. But as far as like an ongoing tally, we just ask okay. them to say hi as often as they okay. want. Tell us what school they're joining from. Okay. See, I don't see the, uh, I don't see the chat icon. Okay. Uh, the chat is on YouTube, so if you have another device, you can pull up YouTube. Uh, actually, my daughter has from it. the JCPS Digital Learning Channel, uh, and then you can uh, see my the daughter live chat has on YouTube. It. She needed my other machine to do some homework in. So, do I go ahead and just start get rolling with this? If you want, it's one thirty. Oh. It is your time, and I'll let you All know right. if I see any questions in the chat. All righty. Well, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Okay. Screen. Um, I don't know if that's what screen. I can't tell. I'm, I'm it's not looking using at me Google right me. now. So yeah, you're sharing. If you want to hit the little hide button on there, it'll hide that button. Oh, okay. you hit stop sharing. There you go. All right. Okay, so I have Infinite Campus up. Does everybody yes, see Infinite Campus? Yep. Yes. Okay, great. Well, what I'm gonna talk about today is there are some new options in Infinite Campus reports that allows teachers to customize them to their everyday need instead of checking and unchecking boxes each time. So I'm just gonna show a couple of things that people may not have been aware of. So within Campus Instruction, I'm coming over here to reports. And this environment that I'm displaying today is a scrambled environment with fake data that won't show real student information. It's a great way for us to demonstrate information while still showing everything that we need to display. So within here is a bunch of different reports. I'm gonna go ahead and start with the blank spreadsheet. And I'm starting with the blank spreadsheet because the blank spreadsheet is a very popular one. Usually when I have teachers in my training, one of the first things they say, one of the first things I ask is, have you learned how to do anything? And they're like, I know how to take attendance and I know how to print the blank spreadsheet. So those tend to be the first couple things that show up. And so now Infinite Campus has the ability to save different versions of things. So I've thought of a couple of different ideas on how to do this. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start off and I'm going to call this one. Let's see. We're on NTI week five. So just to show you a demonstration, I'm going to call this one NTI week five. And now in the blank spreadsheet, there's, there's always been an option to choose however many columns you want. I'm going to choose five columns for Monday, Thursday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. And I'm going to leave the row height at normal, although I can expand it. If you want wider or taller rows, you can do half inch, one inch, two inches. I'm going to leave it at portrait. However, if you had more columns, you might want to change it to landscape. 
But I'm going to show an awesome new feature that a lot of people don't know are available. And that's where I can edit my column headers. Previously, the blank spreadsheet was just as it is. Student names on the left-hand side, blank columns on the top. They can use it for field trips or assignments until they get them in Infinite Campus. And so I'm going to come in here and choose Edit Column Headers. And in this, I'm going to go ahead, and usually these are blank. This is just because I've already created a template. And so I'm going to do May 11th. So, Amy, will it remember whatever you did last and it'll keep those headers? Yes, it will. And I've also, the headers I had before, I saved. And so what it did is it defaulted to the last report type that I had created and put it in there. So the last one I did was called basic template. And I'm going to kind of show that idea of the one they might choose. Like this might be what we want this week, but then we might want to go back to our basic Monday through Friday template. So it kept the last one that I used. That's awesome. Thank you. And, and Heather Worrell likes your hair also. That's in the chat. Oh, thank you, Heather. All right. So I can add additional columns, but today I'm just going to stick with Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. And I'm going to hit update. Again, these are not real students. Now, the other thing is that previously in these reports, you had to run it separately for each section you teach. However, all teachers, now I'm looking at an elementary level, they're going to have math, science, reading, social studies, and so forth. So I'm going to come up here and I'm going to add reading, reading advanced, math, math advanced. And all I'm doing in here is just clicking. And when I click, this drop down shows up. Social studies and science. And then that way, what I'm technically doing here is I'm creating a blank spreadsheet where I can jot down, or let's say I've got people that are helping me to keep track of students and following up with students for NTI participation. And so in this method, this can be printed out or shared and other teachers can go in and say, yes, I've checked with this student. Yes, I've checked with that student or even mark in that assignments have been completed before they actually get inside Google Classroom or in Infinite Campus. So I'm saying that this particular report called NTI Week 5, I want to display for all of my sections. And I want to group by section so that they all don't run together. So then I'm going to come down here and I'm going to do Save Options and call it NTI Week 5. Now, I've got all of these options available, and in the lower left, there's an option to generate CSV, which basically sends it into Google Sheets or Excel. So previously, users only had the option to send this blank spreadsheet to a PDF, which was kind of a bummer when you wanted to edit it. Do you have, is there a question? No. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and just do generate PDF for now. And now, I've got a list for each of my classes, math, math advanced, reading, and so forth, of Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Again, at the beginning, I showed you how I could make the columns a little, or the rows a little bit taller. And so you can use this to mark in a temporary assignment score, to keep track during field trips, to mark NTI participation and so forth. And it shows what classes, the teacher's name, the school name, and so forth. So just kind of one idea as to how you could utilize it. Now, when I exit out, so I'm going to go to a different report. And then I'm going to come back to the blank spreadsheet. And it defaults back to NTI week five, which was the last one I was in. But if I save different versions of this, I can go to apply options. And now up here, I've got NTI week three, NTI week four, NTI week five. And then the last one I had looked at was a blank. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come over here and I'm going to show you uh, basics. So I'm going to call this basic template. And so let's say on my basic template that I want all of these settings to be the same, only I want it to be Monday through Friday. I 
have a hard time scrolling when I'm presenting for some reason. So I hit update. And so now when I look at my apply options, I've got week one, week two, week three. I'm going to go ahead and generate a PDF here. It's already, it's not giving me the basic template as a option because I've already got it pulled up. But now when I display it, I see the same class, but I see Monday through Friday. Now what I can do is come over here and say, right now I want to look at NTI week five. And now I'm back to NTI week five. And so this might be an option to, it can be used for substitute teachers. If substitute teachers come in and you want to give them a basic spreadsheet as to keeping track of things, say somebody goes on long-term leave, when I come back over here to apply options, um, I've got all of the options. I have blank spreadsheet at the very top, the basic option, NTI week five, and so forth. And so again, and I can send this to a doc, which would be like a Google doc or Word. I have my generate CSV, which would send it to Excel, and then I have PDF. So that's one idea of how to utilize this. I'm gonna come over here to a different one. I'm gonna to go to the student summary report, which is a great report that a lot of people might use for parent-teacher conferences and so forth. And previously the student summary report could only be ran for one class, which might be hard for let's say an elementary school who wants to run it for one student for both reading math and science. And those can all be selected over here as well. So you can add multiple sections. I've already done that. There's also three different ways to run this report. The summary is going to be just a grade total. No assignments, no grades individually or anything like that. Just literally their grade total. So the most common use of this report is going to be one student per page. And so I'm going to switch to that option. And then I've got a whole lot of things I can display. I might want to hide any assignments that are exempt because if they're exempt, the student isn't responsible for completing it. And so I won't display it. I might want to display their attendance and have a place where the parent can sign it if I want to use this for parent teacher conferences. If I'm doing it on a student by student basis, I can come down here and just select a specific student and then add a comment up above. Now, just as an example, I'm going to go ahead and select one section and I'm going to come in here and I'm going to do save options and I'm going to call this student summary for parents and then that way when I run the student summary report for different versions I can say maybe this one I just want to go over with the student and then maybe sometimes I don't need to show all of these options maybe I want to show a little bit less but I want to use this report for a different purpose but the really great option I like about it is that you can save different versions of the report for different times. Sometimes you might want to run it and you might say, well, now every time I come in here, I have to uncheck all of these options. So the save options is a way to save the report, save the options on your report and give it a specific name. And apply options is where you have different versions of the report and you're going back and forth. Now, the last option you used is what's going to display the next time you pull up the report. So you may want to go back to that or you can just switch those options. And then again, a lot of these reports have different ways to run it. This one can be exported to a Word or a Google Doc or it can be exported to PDF. So those are some of the nice options as far as that goes. Now I have, does everybody see my I'm hoping this displays my PowerPoint presentation up here. All right. So I outlined here. I outlined here the, the reports and how they can be displayed. All of them are available in PDF except for gradebook export. And the gradebook export is a way to take all of your assignments and all of your grades and export it to Excel or Google Sheets in order to maybe add more information there 
and summarize stuff and so forth. And so the gradebook export is only available in a CSV option. The roster is only available in PDF. Now, previously the roster did not show student pictures in the printable version. Once upon a time, the only way teachers could print student pictures was by printing a seating chart. Now they can print student pictures within a roster and that's available as small picture or large picture. And I'll demonstrate that in a moment. I will make this available in the, in the where everybody can access it. I might just need a little guidance on that, Jim, if you don't mind, of how to attach that to that sheet. But this shows specifically PDF only, what's available in CSV or Excel or Google Sheets, and then also Word and Google Doc. And so previously, in previous years, people were used to only having the option to export things into a PDF. So that's a nice option. Another thing as far as these go that I really wanted to point out to people is there's an additional option at the bottom of campus instruction. There's lots of really great options. And I, you know, this one's specific to reports. I have another session on Google integration and online assessments and things like that. That's really great. This particular one, I'm just want to show you, and I'm going to try and add this to all of mine. There's an option called professional development. And the professional development option within campus instruction directly correlates with what each person currently has rights to. And so any teacher, you know, regardless of the experience, can go into the professional development option and they have access to tutorials, simulations, videos, and things like that that Infinite Campus has put together on how to use certain things. So in this example, I've selected, I've logged in as a teacher and selected Control Center which is the very first screen teachers see when they log on to campus instruction, where attendance can be taken and so forth. And as you can see, this is a tutorial on how to use that. And there's learning content with um, simulation, with a practice simulation and so forth. But teachers can go through and it will show what they've completed and then they can go back and complete more information. And I'm gonna come out of that one for a second. And do however much they want at any point in time. It's completely self-paced. So I'm going to come back to this. Before I move to any other reports, are there any questions that I need to address this time? Nope. I have not seen any questions, Amy. Um, okay. Lots of people saying hi, talking in there, but I have not yep. seen any questions come up. Okay. I would like to say that I really like the picture reports. I thought those were great um, when I could start using that because I would always uh -huh. put that in my sub binder because the substitute doesn't know students' names, but those faces they can easily recognize. Yes. yes. Very definitely. Handy. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to show a couple of other things. So I'm going to come over here to roster. And roster, I think, is one of those things that I don't think people realize really quite how much information they can get in the roster. I have a lot of schools tell me that their teachers want them to print out rosters for them. And I don't think a lot of teachers realize that they can print out their own rosters. And so coming down here, it allows me to um, shade alternate rows if we want to. It allows me to include as little or as much information as possible. So I can come over here and say, I want the student picture and I don't want that teeny tiny picture. I want a large student picture. And I can come over here and say, do I, the household phone number, the address, the guardians, the guardians contact information. Maybe I need to see their date of birth. Now it will let me know if they have health conditions or any of these flags, but it won't specifically let you know the details of all of these. For schools that are tracking lockers, it'll share that locker information. You can include their counselor name, race, ethnicity, and so forth. And so basically this is gonna work the same way as the others. You'll choose whatever options and then you can hit save. And I can say roster with phone number and address and hit save. 
And so now I've got the roster with phone number and address. And then this one, as you can see, only generates in a PDF. So when I generate it into a PDF, I don't think there's going to be pictures because I'm in a scrambled environment that doesn't include pictures. Sometimes a scrambled environment takes a little longer to generate. I'm going to go ahead and exit out of that so that people don't have to wait. But the great thing about this is if you want just a very basic roster printout and you don't want all the phone number information and maybe you just want a small picture and um, just very simple information, you can come over here. I don't want staff number. I don't want incoming students. Then I can hit save, what, save options and say basic roster and hit save. Now, so, when I come over here, I've got multiple options. So, yes, Amy, question. when I make these and I create all these different reports and I learned how to do it and then I save them, are they saved in Infinite Campus so I can use them anywhere I go and pull up Infinite Campus? I have access to those reports to generate them again later on? Yeah, you. they're going to be always available and they're available to basically what's going to happen is they're going to be available to whatever sections you select up here. So if you only, let's say you have a first period, second period, fourth and fifth period class, and you only attach it to the first period class, I believe it's only going to show up for that one unless you add the other ones to it. Well, what happens next year when I have all new sections? Do I lose all the reports I've created? That is a good question. And because this is a new feature this year, I am not sure about that, but I will definitely look into that. Awesome. Thank you. Yes. I'm going to, I'm going to make a note of that. Great question. Thank you. Right. So just kind of as a final, the teachers have lots of different reports up here that are available and there's lots of different versions that can be created. They can even do their own labels in here. And so when creating different types of labels, there is a mailing label and a student teacher label. So they may have one version for each. Now, the thing is, is that you probably want either guardian name or you want to say to the parent or guardian of. So either like Chris and Amy Mueller or to the parent or guardian of Rowan Mueller. So I would probably, if they're going to use labels, create one version. So I would probably come in here and not say include guardian. We don't really have private mailing addresses, and I would just leave it at that. And then I would save this version as mailing address label so that I don't have to choose those options or so I don't generate those labels with those additional options I may not want. And that is basically everything. I wanted to leave a couple extra minutes in case anybody had any questions for me. Actually, I will show one last thing. On the left, there's an additional option called custom links and reports. And this is where we at JCPS are able to attach additional reports that people may want to utilize. And this also includes the NTI student participation attendance report that teachers can generate. We are also linking to a lot of other videos. So this is not canned reports that come with Infinite Campus. These are additional reports that we make available. So anytime I have teachers in my training, I always encourage people to check back here to see what new reports are available. When people ask about how to use the messenger, I do always say, we've got some videos in there on how to use the messenger. We're happy to walk people through it, but we are trying to remember to link to Infinite Campus videos that have been generated. So that's my final mention on reports. I think that covers any everything as far as reports go. That is amazing. Thank you, Amy. Um, so if I have an idea for a, a report that I think would be used around the district or whatever, would I be able to send that to you as an idea for one of those reports to get added to that? Um, that's a good question. Yes. Well, as far as custom links and reports go, any we can link any, any kind of teacher reports, um, so NTI student participation, as an example, I'm trying to think of how to phrase this. That report was created by JCPS and is not one that comes with Infinite Campus. And they decided to make a teacher version link and place it in here. And so any kind of reports that are beneficial for teachers to run, 
we can look at that and add that to teachers' permissions to have available to them. And so that way they would have it either there or they can switch over to campus tools to be able to view the reports there. But I've also, most of this is just videos that I've linked to either that I've created or Michelle's created or videos that are created by Infinite Campus or documents that include instructions on things. So those are the different types of things that can be linked in here. That's very helpful. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so I'm looking in there and I'm not seeing any questions. Okay. Um, lots of hellos. Uh, Sade Graves says she also likes your hair. Thank you. They're right on the hair <laughs> train. I like that. Um, so with the Infinite Camp, that's really such a, a deep tool. I, I love that. What, what do you think is probably your most asked question about that when you have someone that needs help? As far as the reports area? Anything. Sure. Anything. We're on your time. <laughs> <laughs> um, gosh, I don't know. Of course, right now it has to do with assignments in different ways. Oh. But um, one of the things, that, probably one of the big questions people ask is questions regarding Google. And so I'm really hoping that a lot of people tune in to my Google integration. One that's on Thursday and Friday so that they can learn more about how to kind of combine the two together. And it won't talk about we don't have yet the ability to dump grades from Google Gradebook into Infinite Campus, but it does talk about a lot of other options that I think people will find to be really helpful. So, and I do. Stephanie Mills was on this morning talking about the integration with Infinite Campus, which was very helpful for a lot of people. Uh, and her mm -hmm. presentation is linked also. And okay. I know she'll be on Friday in the morning. I see her on there again. Um, so. The schedule is very handy. Check that out uh, if you guys have questions about this and how it integrates, because we do get, I, uh, I'm going to agree with you, we get a lot of questions on um, when does it update, how does it update, why am I losing this student, and Stephanie talked all about that this morning, and mm -hmm. that episode will, of course, be cut out for all the viewers out there that haven't seen it, and it'll be posted at a later time. So hit that subscribe button down there, and you'll get a notification when we post that new video along with all the others that we post. Um, so let's see, questions, qu nobody's posted a question yet. I'm the only one bothering you. <laughs> I love it. I love any questions from anybody. I'm glad I'm glad you're bringing some in. If nobody else has any, I'm glad you're contributing to that, so I will awesome. keep you on your toes. All right. All right, it's 156. Uh, Ms. Brown, did you have anything to add? She's muted. I have no idea. She's muted. You're muted, Michelle. <laughs> we always keep that muted button to going, don't we? No, I'm yes. good. Amy, Amy, Amy does a great job. Thanks. Thanks. My teammates always look for my mute button. It's hard to find. Um, so <laughs> thank you both. And I right, will run my mouth you. here. I got about two minutes to talk about um, all the episodes and things going on, how to find our videos. So if you go to the jcps.me forward slash NTI, click on the teacher toolkit on the left and on the right hand side on the bar, you will find that virtual training schedule and it will take you to all the great episodes we have going on here. And it looks a little something like this. And what I was talking about is if you go to any of the blue portions, uh, like I was talking about Stephanie Mills presentation this morning, I go to her name right there. And when you click on that or hover on it, it will pop up with any resources they use throughout their episode. So definitely check those out. Even if you haven't seen the episode, there may be something in there you want to see and you go, oh, I do want to catch that episode when they bring it back. Also, if you haven't, go ahead and follow JCPS Digital Innovation, uh, my team that I'm a part of. Not my team, not my team. That'd be Miss Warrell in the chat, her team. JCPS. DI at JCPSDI is the JCPS Digital Innovation Twitter handle. And uh, if you were with us last night, you didn't know we had a great Twitter chat going on with the middle school system. And we had the uh, Michelle Dillard on there, uh, Miss Rosenthal was on there, lots of educators, librarians, everything from the middle schools, and really anybody from JCPS. There was a lot of people on there voicing uh, lots of fun thoughts, uh, different things going on how they're using technology, just saying hello. Um, so 
stop by, check that out. And you can also follow the hashtag JCPS, capital D, dig, capital I, N. JCPS, dig in for digital innovation. And we're definitely digging in uh, in these last several weeks going on with NTI. All right. I see we have Melissa and Shelby. They are joining us to discuss at two o'clock theater during NTI. Ooh, love it because lots of people are interested in related arts and how those things are being conducted during NTI. So that is going to be a great session. And it is 159. So I'm going to ask Melissa Shelby, are you two available? Are you there? Hey, Russ, it's Melissa Gano, the district uh, arts instructional lead, and Melissa, Shelby Stage were here. Hello. Hello, Shelby. And this is Jim. Oh, sorry. Oh, you're sorry. Fine. I thought Russ was leading today. I'll, I'll take that as a compliment. Wrapping up another meeting. Who will be presenting today, or will both of you? I'm just kind of looking for who my well, screen share person is going to be. Uh, we're both presenting, um, okay. but I will be running the uh, slides presentation. Okay. And Shelby will be doing most of the talking. <laughs> All right. So I'll, I'll kind of bookend her at the beginning and the end. Do you want to try to get those slides up? Okay. Hang on. Oh, you're fine. You're fine. Okay, and to hit present. Uh, your screen is still muted. You'd have to unmute your video for the Hangout. Okay. There you go. Except I got a symbol showing up. So yeah, where's snap the camera? Today? Looks like you got Snapchat open. <laughs> I don't know what Snapchat's doing on there. What is Snapchat on? It's not mine. <laughs> <laughs> So let me see. So why is Snapchat there? So let's, let me change that. Here we go. Now we're up there. There you are. And then um, I'm going to hit share screen and get the presentation up. All right. While we're waiting, uh, lots of people in the chat today love seeing you guys out there. Great conversation going on. Be sure to tell us who you are and what school you would be joining us from if you were at school or what building you may be from in the district. And if you have any questions, please post them. I will send them over to our wonderful ladies presenting this afternoon on theater. And we see your presentation. If you want to hit hide on the uh, hangout button, and then also, if you would turn on, hit that CC button for closed captioning. And then, oh, you're on it. There you go. Allow. And it will pick up all the things that we say and transcribe it. Fabulous. All righty. It's a couple minutes after. We'll go ahead and get started. Um, this afternoon's session is on theater during non-traditional instruction, challenges faced by performance-based learning content areas. I'm Elisa Gano, the district K-12 arts instructional lead over dance, theater, and visual arts. Um, you will have a copy that you can download from the training schedule. So you can spend your time looking over uh, our uh, resumes, if you so, if you so desire, and then Shelby Steed, she was the theater teacher at Atherton High School. She Hello, is, everybody. <laughs> hey, Shelby. Shelby's actually going to be the primary presenter. Um, I'm going to uh, book in her, book into her here at the beginning, at the end. But uh, as she is teaching theater in a classroom. I thought it would be really beneficial to have someone share out exactly what a performance-based course, uh, in this case theater, looks like during online instruction. But before we begin, uh, we're, we may have a variety of audience members who may not have a background in theater or may have questions about exactly what is covered in theater. Uh, the big thing is that theater is one of the visual performing arts content areas. Um, there was a term that KDE used for years called Arts and Humanities, which was an erroneous title 
Uh, the correct title should have been the arts or visual and performing arts that has officially been changed uh, the past, I uh, believe it was about two years ago to visual and performing arts. So we have that corrected. Based on the adoption of the various content areas that fall under visual and performing arts, we have five content areas once new standards were adopted by the state in 2015. So the five visual and performing arts content areas are dance, media arts, music theater, and visual arts. All of those arts content areas are core academic subjects under federal and state law. They have national and state standards. Also, in terms of being a core academic subject under state law, we are included under Kentucky's learner goals. There are seven learner goals that define what um, how standards are supposed to be written and expectations around curriculum and instruction, as well as assessment across the entire state of Kentucky. Um, the arts fall under two of the seven Kentucky Learner Goals, number two and number seven. A big thing to understand is about theater programs. A lot of times people consider um, visual performing arts as the other at the elementary level. They're set aside from the uh, classroom instruction subjects or content areas and um, placed in a group that's commonly referred to as special area. At the middle school, those content areas are um, grouped in a category usually called related arts. But at the high school level, we're just one of the, one of the content areas. It is huge for schools to be looking at programming. And you can go to the state standards link and you can see in the document by grade band level, elementary, middle and high, the state's expectations around the courses um, that should be offered in these content areas and how programming should be structured. At the elementary level, it's primary, primarily exploratory in going through each of the visual and performing arts content areas. At the middle school level, we're trying to establish a grounding in the arts and schools may opt to offer students a specialization. So there may be one of the arts that they are far more interested in and they can specialize even at the middle school level and take a course uh, for several years to prepare them for the high school level programs. And at the high school level, um, the programs are set up that uh, schools determine working with the arts teachers, what is the sequence of courses that students are gonna go through if they wish to specialize in one of the arts to prepare them best for um, post-secondary application. So no matter what they wanna do, whether they want to pursue that, art, that arts discipline, um, or if they want to pursue some sort of straight out of uh, high school, um, an internship or another career, um, in the arts, there are options there as well. Of course, in any career that one may go into, all of the arts have a place in one's life. So I am going to turn it over to Shelby, Shelby by hitting what is our driving question for this session. So if theater, instruction and learning are driven by students creating and performing, and in the arts, creating and performing are huge, those are two of our major anchor standards, so what does that look like during NTI? Yes, so um, I feel very fortunate. Um, Atherton has a wonderful arts program um, and I teach theater all day long. Um, I teach a theater one class, which is an introductory class. I teach a theater two class, which is a second level acting class a theater three and four class that meet together, which is a performance product based class. Um, and I also teach uh, stagecraft classes, which are the technical theater elements. Um, so knowing that I had all of those different contents to think about, um, I really looked at NTI with four major questions um, in that time that we were transitioning. Uh, so the first one is one that any teacher I'm sure is looking at. Where am I in my curriculum and what can I teach in an online format? Knowing that everything that I had planned for that last six, eight weeks of school aren't, isn't going to happen. 
we know that we can't teach exactly like we were going to be in the classroom. So where am I and what can I successfully teach? Um, how can the work be meaningful for my students, but not so much that they, they get stressed out and not anything that requires you to have face-to-face -face video meets because as we know, we've got students that are at all levels of technology and, and time and, and all of that. Um, but then the last two are ones that I actually think uh, when we think back to the idea of this being a program, it's not just one class that I teach and I'm thinking just about those students, but we are a whole program. We work together. Uh, and so what can we do to keep that sense of community within a theater department? And um, what can I uniquely do or what can I do that uniquely engages students that I can't always do in a regular part of my classroom? or class just because I can't hit as many students at once or there are time restrictions, um, things like that. So those are kind of the things that I'm gonna look at today and talk to you guys about. So, um, the first part, curriculum and meaningful work. Um, obviously this far along in our school year, I had a good sense of where we were at and where I was heading and, and all of that. So knowing what I wanted to teach, that was the easy part. Um, to be honest. Uh, and part of that is um, I really take advantage of a lot of online resources and, and groups that had theater teachers from all over the world in it. So I had people as, as resources who started back in January or December doing um, NTI type work. And so I could learn a lot from what they did well and what didn't work. Um, and so for my theater one class and stagecraft classes, um, I kind of fit more into what I was planning to teach uh, no matter what, because my theater one kids were going into theater history. So that is a little more traditional um, of what some of the other core content teachers might be teaching. Um, so if you click on, on that presentation real quick, one of my resources had a great um, free resource they were giving us where I could take all of uh, this unit on Greek theater, which if it was happening in the regular school year, might be a one week project. Um, but because it was in NTI, um, we did it for three weeks. Um, and I broke it up into sections and in each section there were hyperdocs. So if you click on the myth of Dionysus for me and click onto the next screen, when you push click here, it was great because the kids then would click there and it would take them to the website that they wanted to, what, that I wanted them to go to. They learned about it. They had activities that they did with, with this. Um, so we can go out of this um, program if you don't mind and back to the regular slideshow. Um, so that was something that um, I thought was creative and different that I don't do normally in my classroom, but was a, a good way to uh, continue to teach that coursework. Um, and then for my stagecraft class, because they are product based, um, we did similar things, but the product was more uh, set designs and costume designs and things like that. So now going into the actual uh, performance part, um, my upper level kids are very performance based. And in my theater two class, my focus really is different styles and techniques and theories of acting. Um, and so we've been working on different things all school year. And we were partway through looking at different techniques. And we had been working on scenes. So kids had these scenes that they did together in class. And then we'd learn about a different theory. And then we'd apply. It. But that's really challenging to do in this time. Not that kids aren't connecting with each other, but it's much more challenging um, to expect that from all my kids. So we did monologues. And so the first week, they had to pick a blog that they were going to use. So if you'll play first view, this is just a short snippet. Very in some place called Manila. I'll never get to Manila. 
I never got to say goodbye. A lot of things just vanished with no explanation. And I want to know, how was hand left folded in the casket? Because and if you'll stop it there. There was Cobra. A mil- um, I thought I had them timed so that they'd only play for the first couple seconds, but that's okay. So they took a video, they took a monologue, they chose it, and then we explored the different theories. And sometimes I would send out YouTube videos with examples. Um, we were in the middle of learning about Laban at the time, so I was able to just continue that work. Um, and so if you play just the first, like, 10 seconds or so of the first Laban one, um, they had to choose two of them. In a place called Manila. Okay, Shelby, did you want to give an intro to that, and then I'll start yeah, it? Yes, please. So they were to choose two of um, these different elements or styles that he uh, teaches. And so this one is the idea of press. And so they learned all about what that means and how that affects your voice and body. Um, and the second one you'll see is ring. And so there's 10 different ones, I believe, um, if I'm remembering correctly. And they had to choose two that they thought would fit. So it's now looking at comparing their original to these different techniques. Go ahead. Michael's buried in some place called Manila. I'll never get to Manila. I never got to say goodbye. And you can stop there. Finished. And then if you'll play the ring one. Michael's buried in some place called Manila. I'll never get to Manila. I never got to say goodbye. Stop it there. Um, so you can see, and, and both the student and myself, and, and um, what we're planning to do next week is other students can see the difference and, and progression um, of those scenes So and those monologues. So I've really been able to do a lot of that performance element, being able to utilize both of them videoing themselves and reflecting on that and um, using resources online like YouTube videos and things like that. Um, so, so far they've done four monologues. Um, this week they're doing a comprehensive reflection on them um, because my, my thought in what I teach the kids always is not just to act as an actor, but also use your director's eye so they have to reflect back on what they're doing. So that's one of my performance classes. If you'll go to the next slide. Um, so my theater three, four class, like I said, they are very performance based, um, product based. So this year so far, they um, participated in the Kentucky Theater Association One Act Festival. And so we prepared a production. Um, they wrote uh, one minute or 10 minute plays uh, in connection with uh, Actors Theater's um, New Voices um, program. And um, we've learned about different, also different elements of theater and things like that. But the end of the year and what they always look forward to, and this is a tradition in Atherton for uh, like 50 years. Um, in, the, in the spring, they always do original one acts as a festival. Um, and I knew my students were really disappointed that we were losing some of these performance options. So we decided as a group, we were going to shift from doing live rehearsal and performing for a live audience to finding out a way we can make that virtual. Um, and that is a process. We are working on it all the time and trying to figure out how that's going to work. Um, but they, they have together voted on what plays we were going to perform. Um, they've decided who's going to direct the scenes, who are going to be actors in the scenes. We have some people who are going to be editing it together so that we can have uh, actual performances um, that we plan to put up on YouTube, on our YouTube channel. So um, it's giving them that opportunity to still feel like they're performing um, and that their work that they work so hard at the beginning of the school year to write with the purpose of it being performed for an audience actually still gets to happen. Because uh, I truly believe theater isn't truly a finished art form. A piece isn't finished until an audience gets to watch it. Um, so that has been really great and actually has had great um, 
connection from my students. So many of them are participating uh, from that class because I think they're so invested uh, in what we're doing. So um, we're doing Google Meets. We are, they're rehearsing on their own right now. Um, they do reflections every week on how rehearsal's going and I help them find out how, you know, solve some of the problems that maybe they're having. They're having to come up with completely new ideas of how to present these because we're so used to being on stage under the lights with costumes and scenery. So I have some that are doing them as um, like stop action um, cartoon animation. I have one group that decided to do theirs as sock puppets. Um, so they're having a lot of fun and really forcing them to be creative in a way that, that none of us have had to be before. All right, if you'll go to the next slide. All right, so community and engagement. My last section, um, are the, the last two questions. Um, so if you've not ever been in theater, you, um, I'm sure there's other things you've participated in where you've had a sense of community, um, but it's probably the most important part <laughs> of a theater program. Um, that sense of community and family, it, it's what drives a program like ours. And I was really worried about losing that. We, um, we were one week from opening our spring musical, first one they've done in almost 10 years at Atherton, and we had to stop production. Um, so I knew the kids' morales already were low, and I knew they felt disconnected and they missed each other. So I was trying to come up with some interesting ways to um, bring those that sense of community together and that engagement, um, but also to continue to build acting skills. Um, so I came up, one of the things I did is I came up with what I'm calling theater hours. And every day we have, um, or Monday through Thursday, we have a different activity that we do. So it's so open to any of my theater students they all get a Google Meet um, code. We jump on. On Mondays, we do movement and meditation because you know your physical body is a huge part of performance. Um, and Tuesdays, we do virtual improvisation, which has been super fun. Um, so improvisation are a series of games and scenes and uh, things like that that actors study for a long time. Um, but they also are great tools to teach skills and skill building. Um, so it's been great to figure out how to do that in an online setting. Um, Wednesdays have been maybe one of my most fun. Uh, we do new script read-throughs. So I find a script that we haven't read before in class, um, and I send out a link that they can uh, get on to read it, and I put it, I also share my screen. We take parts and we read through it. Um, it's been a ball. Uh, the kids are having a great time. And again, it's introducing them to new things, new, still doing skill building and curriculum, but through something that they feel is kind of an extracurricular fun thing. And then Thursdays have probably been my most successful, uh, which is theater professional question and answer. Um, so I have you know, reached out to my theater professional friends uh, all over the country, and they have been willing to jump on and do an hour um, conversation with my students. They talk about what their jobs are and um, answer questions and give great advice. And this is something that I always have wanted to do more systematically within my classroom. So this actually has been one of my benefits of NTI because I have the time to be able to do that and the way to to do it where all my kids who want to participate can come together. Um, and then the other part is virtual performances. And I already talked about the theater three, four class, um, but my freshmen and sophomores are actually writing their own original play. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that in a minute. So um, if we go to the next, I would love to show you just a couple of clips um, and again, I'm hoping that they'll they'll pause where, where they're supposed to. Um, they might not. We'll see if it's if edited the way that it was supposed to on here. Um, but um, my first ones, I had both Colin Bradbury and Brian Bogan who came on. They are both 
New York based. Um, Colin is a performer and um, on Broadway and touring and things like that. Brian is a stage manager. And so they had really great insight, especially since so many of our kids think about Ooh, New York, that's where to go. Um, I thought that would be a great kind of connection. So let's see where it's, if it starts correctly. How your job works. So I have had the, in my opinion, pleasure of being a swing and a dance captain. As uh, Shelby said, I've swung four different shows and I've been a dance captain on three of those shows. The rest of my career has been just me in the ensemble. Um, my focus is dance, but I also sing and act. Um, I've had to understudy principal roles in various shows. Um, so I've had to do kind of almost everything you are able to do as a performer in the show. Awesome. And we'll just look at the next one as well. I know we're getting a little short on time, but this one is good because it, I like that students were able to ask questions. So if you go, thank you. Any other, does anybody have a question they want to ask? I have one. I'll you read it. So yes. what, I hear a lot of people getting jobs mainly from connections, but what would be your advice for someone like new fresh out of college, they don't have the background as many seasoned performers? That's a great question. And you are 100% accurate in saying that it's all about connections. Um, and it will be that way for every part of the field that you go into. I mean, frankly, it's probably that way about every job that you do. Um, but it's, I, I would say it's very important in the, the arts, uh, in the arts field. Um, for me, what, what I recommend to people, particularly on the technical side, is a little harder to do, uh, or might be a little bit counterproductive for performers. But what I found very useful is uh, doing an internship, if that's at all possible. All right, so, and, and if you want to click on our um, Google slide deck later and want to look at some of the others, we got to talk to a number of different people. So uh, we've got a couple more we're going to do. I want to take just a moment to talk a little bit about our last virtual performance because um, I think it's super fun. My freshmen and sophomores, usually we do a one-act play that's already scripted but we uh, decided to move it virtually and they wrote their own play and they're calling it the Corona Zone um, based on um, just the Twilight Zone feel of being in here. And um, they've written scenes and monologues about their experiences or funny things that they have um, they think about when they're, they're thinking about uh, this, this time being in isolation. Uh, so it's been really a, a great creative outlet for all of us. We'll be on a Google Meet and an hour and a half will go by. We won't even notice because uh, we're so into uh, that, which has been so good for that creative performance aspect. So that's something else we're going to video and show on YouTube uh, once school is out. So um, that is, I think, the last of my slides. Um, are doing at Atherton, at least in theater, as far as um, being a performance-based class. Okay, thank you, thank you, Shelby. Really appreciate that. Um, if there are any questions, Jim, did you see anything in the chat? Okay. All right. So the last couple of slot, uh, the last slide that I wanted to provide you, along with Shelby's help, um, is some general resources and some NTI specific resources. Of course, at any time you can go to the teacher backpack um, for theater. There is a theater teacher backpack, which I have the hyperlink directly there. I also maintain um, a district arts Google site as I cover dance K twelve dance theater and visual arts. So tons of information about theater there. During this uh, NTI period, I also created a lesson and resource sharing site for theater teachers. Um, all my different teacher groups have um, a Google Drive folder that they can work in and share resources. Also, of course, through the district NTI portal um, in the teacher toolkit for NTI, you can there are resources that are listed there as well. Uh, those same resources are also found 
um, in the NTI lesson resource and res uh, resource share Google Drive folder in an online resources document that has really blown out with lots of additional online resources being shared. Uh, a couple of others um, is the Educational Theater Association, one of the national uh, uh, teachers of theater associations. And then there's also a company called Theater Folk that also has created some online resources as well that we've provided. Contact information at any time. You can reach out to either of us if you have any questions um, about today's presentation or theater in general. Feel free to reach out to Shelby or me at any time. And that was really all that we had. So um, if we don't have any other questions, no, not currently. And you, that was great. You guys went right to the wire on that. I, I will say that uh, as a teacher, I mean, I appreciate the fact that you're going hey, out Jim, and bringing in those professionals from outside and look like you were obviously doing that. Jim, you're muted. Even, what's that? I'm muted. How about <laughs> that? Well, you two heard all that, but let me rephrase it to you. I was going to say you guys did a great job uh, being done like right at the wire. And then I talked on mute. But uh, what I was saying was I really appreciated the fact that you brought in outside individuals and it looked like you were obviously doing that before NTI that and this is such a great time to bring those people in because you can set up those talks with them because almost everyone's working from home. So if you're in the sciences, you can talk to engineers, things like that, bring them in and have those talks, even if your students aren't there like you did, you could record those conversations, maybe have some pre-recorded questions from students that you can present to them. But it's just a, a great time to take uh, take advantage of that. And you did a great job with that. Thank you. Okay, well, um, again, thank you for uh, allowing us to present here. And um, teachers, um, administrators, any questions about theater, feel free to reach out to myself or uh, Teaching Theater with Shelby. Thank you. Awesome, thank, thank you, you ladies. All right. Hello, welcome to the JCBS Digital Learning Channel. If you're just joining us at 2.30, we have our final live presentation with Jessica Cullen and Sade Graves talking about NTI in the primary grades, which is such a great place to talk about it because it can be somewhat challenging for teachers with the primary students. Uh, you will see our next two using Jamboard for voice choice and collaboration and using photo voice during NTI are available on demand and they are linked on that virtual training schedule, which you can get from the NTI website. Or you can also just take the easier out and look down below in the description box. There's a link down there too. So check that out. Hello, Sade. Hello, Jim. How are you? Not bad. I got to run and get some checks mix and maybe some pretzels and I'll be back. <laughs> Jessica, how are you? I'm super excited to have Jessica here with us. This is our second well, in person to today. I'm excited. Excited to talk about NTI in the primary classroom. So Jessica is our superstar today. So I'm just her hype woman. So <laughs> are you going to be presenting slides, Jessica? I am. All right. Shall oh, I you up on how to do that? Miss Strange is in the chat, so that's great. She's oh, she principal. Uh, thanks, Connie. I don't know. It, it, I couldn't have done any of this without amazing administration. We kind of, they, Miss Strange and Miss Cummings, when she was there, mm -hmm. they made sure about two, three years ago that we all got Google certified. And so we, as a school, are probably 5% Google certified. So we were prepared awesome. for this. And I encourage anyone that is not Google certified to do that over the summer, over this break, because that was a huge learning curve for us as a staff. And, now you're and we how were able to show that was. Yeah. Yes. So and then we used, you know, for, for three years, I've had. Chromebooks and use Google Classroom with first graders and all the way, you know, up to fifth grade kindergarten as well. So during this pandemic, they've gone home and it's it's not really new to them. It might be new to the parents, but oh, yeah. not so much to the students. Yeah. 
Well, while you get your slides up, that goes right into what Heather was talking about, Heather Worrell, this morning about the top down. So it comes from the administration. So when you have that strong leadership in place, like you said, Ms. Strange and Ms. Cummings mm -hmm. when was there, when you have that leadership and they are saying, okay, let's pass this culture on to our teachers, then it's passed on to the students. And like you said, now that we're in this NTI situation, all of that has worked together to make this probably a more easy process for your students at Eisenhower. Exactly, exactly. And a few, um, I think it was last year, the year before we even had a technology night that parents are invited in each classroom kind of talked about different things from Epic to Boom Cards to Google Classroom. That was a great way to show parents and guardians what we were doing in the classroom. And I know that that's something we're looking at again this coming school year to kind of curb some of the question that parents have about just Google Classroom, logging in, that things of that nature. Yeah. Well, I'm excited. Let's right. get started. All right, let's go. Do, can you see my screen? I did it right. And will you just press oh. on that CC button, the captions? Um, well, oh, yes. If, yeah. Well, present mode. Just back that's okay. There we go. Yep. There we go. Is it on? Yep. Perfect. Okay. So I wanted just to share kind of a snapshot of things that I have been doing with my first graders. And I think a lot of this could go across grade levels. My husband, he teaches high school and he teaches PE high school. And I have, he has actually used some of my ideas with his students. So that was kind of cool to see him using screencast find things with his students um, as a PE teacher. So um, I tried to link as many things on these different slides for you all to use in your own classroom. The first thing I wanted to talk about, I, this is something very little, but I think my students loved it, was just digital stickers. I found a lot of free ones on Teachers Pay Teachers. You can make them. You can just use your bitmojis or even just emojis for that instant feedback. Um, I know everyone loves a sticker. I love stickers. So it was just a quick way to slap something on their work that they were turning in. Here was just an example of a sheet they did on frogs. It was just a little fact finding, just putting on a sticker. I thought it was a great way to show that I've seen it and they did a great job. Yeah. And you know, when we talk about the NCI process, one thing that people always say is that student feedback is really important. So that's just mm -hmm. something quick and easy that you can do to let them know, hey, I appreciate you doing your assignment. Good job. Right. Because it's, it's a lot of things to check over and you know you might not always have time to type out a response to everything especially something quick and easy like that even just a bitmoji in you know with bitmojis you can type in different words and it'll put whatever words you want on there so you can kind of have an option of what you want to work with yeah. um, screen castify and the audio option on google slides i think is very key in the classrooms, especially primary classrooms with, with non-readers, new readers. It's very something that you can use in and out of the classroom. So if you're doing NTI days or even in the classroom, I use a lot of Screencastify, especially this whole break. Um, I think I linked, I won't bore you all, but it's just a video of me doing a quick lesson. I think I videotaped myself a million times starting over and over and over trying to get it perfect. But it also gave myself and my students a little bit of normalcy to see me making an acre chart, completing math problems, modeling writing, modeling different things they were I wanted them to do. Also, I made for our school a screencast to, we sent out to all the parents of just how to log on to a Chromebook, log into Google Classroom, I did it from a student view, I used my own child, just to kind of show them what Google Classroom would even look like. Because for some of the parents, it was probably the first time, for probably most of them, to see Google Classroom and kind of see what they were having to get into. So Screencastify is just a great tool to use. You can also use Screencastify 
for strictly audio. And now that Google Slides has a fairly new um, update to where you can insert audio into your slides, I've used Screencastify if it's a longer audio, like if I'm reading a story or a passage that's on the screen, or they're linked on this microphone over here is a free online recording tool that I use for just quick recordings. And the next slide is kind of some examples. I got this idea from Kelsey Bishop with her guided reading slides. And this was just an example of a lesson with their word work portion of a guided reading lesson. I just quickly put in different words that they would listen to and then they would type the word into the analogy chart. That way they are listening to the words and it's not already written on the screen, kind of challenge them a little bit more. This also was from a guided reading lesson. I am in this audio just kind of giving them instructions and directions. So that's a great way in the classroom during reading workshop time, math workshop, you can leave directions for those non-readers or read a story that might not have an audio feature. And then also just kind of if they were going to insert a picture, just a quick explanation of how to do that because some of my students chose to write, which was perfect, their answers on regular paper and then just take a picture and they posted it onto this slide when they were doing their work. I just want to say that with Screencastify and using mm -hmm. the audio in the Google Slides, that's really beneficial for students because I know my son, uh, and you, you said your husband is a high school teacher, my son mm -hmm. is in high school, and they've been using a lot of Khan Academy. And Khan yes. Academy is, you know, really beneficial for teaching the concepts. However, what they miss there is that connection of being able to see their teacher every day. Or, you know, when students are really connected to their teacher, they sort of learn better from that teacher as opposed yeah. to learning from that person in that Khan Academy video. And not to take away from anything of, of Khan Academy, they're awesome. Um, but I do think that that personalized touch of using screen Screencastify or the audio recording with the Google Slides does help students to stay connected to their instructor as well as um, do a little bit better when they're kind of getting that instruction from somebody who they've been working with for the whole year. Right. And and going along with that, I know the terminology that I've used throughout um, the school year, they'll understand. And I had many parents message me and just, even if I posted myself reading a book, they, you know, would just tell me that the kids were so much happier to watch that than, you know, just read a book on their own. You know, it actually, and selfishly, it gave me a little normalcy. Yeah. And for myself, I felt that I was contributing more, I guess, it, by videotaping myself. It was it was a little weird at first. Sometimes I would make my children sit in there and just be like an audience, so I didn't sit and talk to myself the whole time. But it was it got better, and I really enjoyed it. And I think it's something I can take back into the classroom as well to even just as a like a how-to video or whatnot that kids can go back and look at. Even if it, I think I've. Last year, I made like a little how-to of how to put things in their backpack so that they didn't have to come ask me a million times in the classroom when they have something backpack worthy. Then they can go back, look at that how-to video that's posted somewhere and, and kind of do that on their own, take their own initiative to do that. And it gets easier as time goes on. The first time you do it, you're going to record a million times trying to be perfect. Mm -hmm. But then you mm -hmm. think, I'm not perfect in front of them. So why do I need to be perfect? <laughs> <laughs> right, know? right. I think as as the weeks have gone on, less makeup was on. My hair was up in a ponytail. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it got, <laughs> they yeah. were probably more normal. Um, and I know that later on this week, I think, Thursday, there's an episode that I'm looking forward to about the Bitmoji virtual classroom. That is such, you know, kind of the craze right now. And this is kind of my take on it. It's just a little fun. And I learned actually on Twitter from a JCPS teacher that you can replace your audio image, like that little speaker, with another image. So I replaced my Bitmoji and I'm just 
telling the students, kind of reading what the words say to give them directions. And these are just simply YouTube books that they can click on and view and then take AR because they are running out of books at their house, I know. And just kind of linking things for them to do at home is simple. You can even link yourself reading books, little screencast about videos, something perfect for them to listen to at home. And I've seen, um, I've used math on here to link brain pop videos, link myself to videos. This is very fun. So if you are interested in this, definitely come back. I think it's Thursday to learn about that. I know a lot of people are interested in those Bitmoji classrooms. I've seen it know, it's, it's a little addicting once you get started. And I'm not it. into it because I know that I would sit there and try to make my perfect. So I'm going to hold it, out. Yes, yes. If you have a few hours to kill, maybe. But if you don't, maybe hold off because it, it does get a little addicting because um, I do not like to decorate my own house, but I was having fun decorating, you know, a classroom or a room, what I thought it should look like. <laughs> Moving on, I, I wanted to bring a lot of student choice into this NTI and through a primary classroom, luckily my wonderful teammate, Haley Pack, she had an idea to do um, independent studies through with our children and we named them Passion Projects. We first sent out a Google form and I linked it here so people could kind of see what the Google form had entailed. It wasn't anything amazing. It just had different subject and topics that they might be interested in. So therefore they ended up to kind of all choosing, of course, something different, which I was glad. And some people chose space. There was baseball, swimming, dance, um, animal, just all different kinds of zoo animals, sea animals. And so I created different slides for them to work on. I linked a couple to the slides. They, I had different links for them to, I'll actually show it. One of my, this is a space one. He wanted to learn about space. Then I gave him a little bit of choice where he was able to choose between astronauts, stars or space rocks and planets. They didn't have to use the slides as they're planning. It was completely optional. They could use, of course, paper and pencil, however they wanted to. They talked about what kind of things they wanted to focus on, questions they were wondering about. I went ahead and set up different epic collections, videos, links to different sites about their topic. And then they got to choose how they wanted to present their passion or kind of teach us. And we're going to have a Google Meet to show that. Some of them did posters. Um, my little girl that learned about different types of dances, she actually created a dance and sent the video in. Um, someone else, an option to do like a Lego baseball field, you know, just different ways for them to use their, their passion and show us about that passion and kind of in their own way. It doesn't have to be a poster. It doesn't always have to be a Google slide. I wanted them to take ownership and that it's a perfect backpack piece that shows their innovation, their creativity and everything. Um, this little boy actually... I think it's important for, people, for, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but just to point yeah. out that, you know, these are first grade students, right? Yes, very. Yep. So that, and when they are able to demonstrate their learning and have autonomy over their learning, you know, if first graders are doing this, as we get up in middle and high school, there's no reason why those students should not have that same um, choice in their learning. This is so awesome. I just cannot express to you how, you know, awesome it is for students to be able to vocalize what they want to learn about and then to be able to have, you know, that agency over their learning. Mm -hmm. um, Do they use any, I'm just curious as a former library media specialist, was Ms. <laughs> Nelson your um, library media specialist, did they use any of the uh, resources on the LibGuide for research or are they just using Epic books? Not just Epic. They used Capstone, Pebble Go. Um, what else have we used? I love like Tumble Pebble Books. Go. I do too. I do too. I really like that. Um, and they and I used Screencastifies of myself reading Pebble Go a lot to them, or just linked it to where they would brain pop. Just all those different tools. Uh, just it, it is a lot of links, but uh, kids are able. To, you know, they know how to 
go to all these different YouTube videos and go here and go there. So I wasn't worried about being overwhelmed. They all seem to do a great job. And you can see on your screen, this little boy, he chose to do a Google slide and he's got the back, the background. Um, the, the previous slide right here, I made an example in each of these text box have a link to a screencastify of just a quick how to, oh. um, you know, how to choose a background, how to change your font, how to make text boxes and, you know, and kind of just a little guide for them so they didn't feel so lost when they were doing it. I had several students um, make several slides to do that. They, you know, didn't just do one slide. They had several slides or made videos. They were able to do all this stuff, insert images, like you can see on his planets. He's got all the different images. Um, I think it, it. this is very helpful as they go through the years because think about these are first graders. Think about when they get to fourth, fifth, and sixth grade doing all these different things. They're going to be amazing. I'm just, I'm very proud and I love looking back at these projects. So this week we did, I took it a little narrowed it down and I try to put with choice boards as you can see kind of there's bees and ladybugs we did a critter choice board and they could choose between just those two and then there was a choice board so say if they chose bees every day for a couple of days they would take a choice board they would copy and paste their x and put it over that square of which activity they did and some of the activities are reading a book um, listening to myself read a book. I did Pebble Go. They have links to Pebble Go and Capstone. Um, there's also create a new habitat for the bee. And I had kids send me pictures that they use Play-Doh or Legos or, you know, what materials at home to do that. Because I, I don't want everything to be just on a screen. You know, they have to have that balance at home where they're doing things art-wise. They could create a garden that the ladybug would love to live in. You know, just things that they are going to be excited about, especially, you know, eight weeks at home or six weeks of MTI there, they might be getting a little stir crazy as yeah, we all are. That balance, we had mm -hmm. some um, ladies from our early childhood department mm -hmm. on, and they talked about, you know, screen time for early learners. And, you know, when we talk about k can too, we're not saying that that's all that they should be doing. They shouldn't just right. be to, you know, a, a device all day, but it is, they are able to do it. So to incorporate that into the instruction is beneficial for the students so that they can have those skills as they get older. But I love how you are also incorporating some things in that are not tied to um, digital tools that, so that they can still have that hands-on learning, you know, um, we had a woman on that was doing puppets for the early childhood. And, you know, I know oh, that's children, awesome. when I was in the library, they love that stuff. So, but yes. is great. I have a question about the, yes. the, Google, the Google form. Uh -huh. you, you put that out there for them first. And yes. then they gave that when they submitted it back to you, then you mm -hmm. were able to guide them to which product they were going to create. Yes. Yes. I sent it to them and I sent it to their parents just so they would have a little guidance with their parents. And, you know, not everyone filled it out and that's okay. I kind of, you know, they still got choice of different things that I tried to get with their parent or whomever. Um, yeah, they, in that Google form, that's a link so you can see exactly what it was, you know, just lots of different things. They even had a, you know, a spot where they could answer, you know, if they had an idea for something that wasn't on there. Um, somebody had put cooking on there that was different that, you know, I didn't have listed as a topic. We use Google Forms a lot. Every um, week they had a Google Form. We love a Google ass Form. <laughs> assessment and an assessment for spelling. And, you know, I would just put a screencast of a video in there of me um, reading their spelling words and they would take a test typing it in there. So they're very familiar with Google Forms. We've used it with Whenever I would purchase scholastic books, they would get a choice of what book they would want. They could go and look at kind of a preview of the book and choose which book they wanted me to order, things like that. So they're very familiar with Google Forms. I do love Google Forms. Um, also, we have sent it to our parents um, and asked after that first week, well, I kind of, I think that's my next, well, it isn't my next one, so I'll hold off on that. But this is something that is new to my kids, Jamboard, and I learned it from you guys on J JCPS's learning channel. Um, I don't, I'm kind of 
sad that I have never used it before. So I was really yeah. excited about it. Vanessa loves Jamboard. Elaine and Russ Hockenberry, they love it. Like they love I, it. <laughs> and I was a Padlet person. So I would use Padlet um, a lot, but I really enjoy Jamboard. And I stole this, the little numbers um, from the JCPS. I can't remember who it was right now. Um, from her, where she had all her students' numbers with the little post-it notes, and then they would answer questions by putting their post-it note on top of their number. So it's a quick way. She had shown it with a check-in so she could see if someone was feeling sad multiple times. I did it. Um, actually, this Make It Monday up here was just yesterday. So um, not all of them got to answer yet when I screenshot this, but it was just a quick little number talk-ish um, virtually make it Monday where they would make an equation and put it on their sticky note. And also that's a quick way to see who is um, attending to your work. Then this was just a student choice of what something they want to learn about or what they wanted more review on as well as our VIP of the day, my teammate Haley Peck. She came up with this idea of how to celebrate the kids for the end of the year we're going to have an end of the year awards Google meet, but also every day there's a jam board dedicated to one of our students and people are able to put little notes to him or her. And that's something that they can keep as like a memory from first grade. There's so many different ways to use Jamboard though. I really, really like it. So I encourage anyone out there. That has end of the yeah. year activity. That is so cute. I love that. Cute. I wish I could take the um, credit for coming up with it, but I can't. But I will <laughs> totally steal it and did steal it. And I, I love it. And I love going back and reading what they are writing to their friends. Of course, I am an emotional mess all the time. So I was like, oh, they're so cute. But they they are doing a really great job. And it, they're so cute. It's just that really so cool to give them that you know, closure to have those mm -hmm. nice words to end out the school year. I really love that people are making sure to incorporate some end of the year activities as we wrap up our NTI for the year. Yes, it's very important to wrap it up because we would be doing this in the classroom. So you can bring whatever you're doing into the classroom virtually in, in any way. Um, last, in kind of going along with that is a quickly talk with Google Meets. I've tried to have one or two Google Meets a week with my class um, at different times. I've sent cute little invitations to, you know, kind of just get them excited about that, especially at the beginning. Um, I've The ones that are underlined over here, I linked different slides that I used in Meets. We've used scavenger hunt, storytelling, directed drawings, guess the picture. I didn't want to do a whole lot of um, academic Google Meets especially at first, because I just want to connect with my kids, talk mm -hmm. to them, give them an outlet to just be kids and not have to do work with me and kind of, um, you know, not see each other and talk to each other. Yeah. And I stole some of these ideas, um, like scenarios for the Barker Finch crew on uh, Twitter, categories, Yes, the picture was really fun. It was just as, and it's linked on there. It was just a zoomed in picture of an animal, very zoomed in and they had to guess it. And they laughed so hard. It was, it was an amazing day just to listen to those little giggles. Um, we did a make me laugh challenge, which they brought their best jokes. And I think I was the only one that lost because I laughed at everything. Um, and then also, I think this is, this would was really important. I had a parent guardian only meet, meet a few times, especially at the beginning of NTI. It was, I had one the night before NTI started to kind of go through things that we were doing. And then I had one later on that week of the first week of NTI just for questions and concerns. That really gave a chance for me to speak to the parents and them only and kind of get see how they were feeling about NTI and what they, you know, kind of give them a heads up. I shared my screen with them, showed them exactly what their kids were doing. Then the next week we sent out an, a Google form at, to the parents kind of gauging, you know, how much time their kids were taking on things, if they were having trouble connecting to anything, what we could do better to, you know, kind of streamline things. And we got some really great feedback. You know, we were, it was a little too busy with some of our slides. Um, because I, I didn't know who was still working and who was at home with their kids. So that way we just kind of got um, details from them 
to kind of fix what we are doing. Well, Jessica, all of the, it has been so beneficial. You've had a lot of love in the chat, a lot of people from Eisenhower saying how awesome you are and how you have helped out with the process of NTI. So you got a lot of fans out there. They love you. And you'll be back two times this week, right? One mm -hmm. yes. on, are we Friday? We are. Friday. And then you have K Can 2. K Can with, 2 on Friday as well. So, yeah. So two more times on Friday. Those viewers out there, if you love and Jessica, you got two more times with the year. I'll have to pay my friends later. <laughs> well, Jessica, it's really, I, I mean, I even commented in the chat. I was like, oh, the slides are just amazing. Your sense of colors with them are just so fun and on point. It's just really good. Well, Very this, um, yeah, being um, homebound almost, it <laughs> forced me to really, I, I am, I am a little extra with my slides, but it's okay. I don't apologize. Oh, for no, it. I love, no, don't no. apologize. They're great. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you for being here. And of course, anytime. Bye. All right. Well, that brings us to our three o'clock time slots with JCPS Digital Innovation and our virtual training. And if you want to get those great slides, you can check out the links that uh, Miss Cullen, sorry, Miss Cullen put up on the website. They are down there. Check them out. Great information. Uh, the next two episodes we have are on demand. You can play them at your leisure. Use that power of pause, stopping for all the great stuff. And there is a lot of great information in them. We have using Jamboard for voice choice and collaboration. And you saw in Miss Cullen's slide set, she had some of the Jamboard uh, lessons going on there with the collaboration between the students. Amazing tool. And then also using photo, photo, my apologies, it's been a long day, using photo voice during NTI, an episode for that also. All of those are up on the JCPS Digital Learning Channel. On YouTube, hit that subscribe button, be updated when we put these new episodes out. Stop back, see us, say hi, all right? And we will see you all tomorrow morning live once again. Be there, see you tomorrow.